to say a few more thoughts related to what he was just presenting. No, okay, so, um, no, because we, we were discussing uh, some issues uh, related to communication, and I think, uh, and I think it's important that this uh, subject uh, comes up also at a certain moment of the school. So the point is, uh, one thing that we learned with uh, COVID-19 is the importance of communicating science to, uh, to the larger public and to decision makers. And that poses challenges to everybody that uh, is involved in, in doing science uh, related to the epidemics. One thing is, uh, it is not uh, just, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, if you talk to people that are not scientists, you have to be uh, communicating in, in a simple way. But then the challenge is to communicate in a simple way, but uh, not, uh, uh, not forgetting to talk about essential things. And um, one point, which is very important, I think, is have scientists in general, let's say people that do modeling, okay, for uh, uh, be uh, be good communicators, or have they always been uh, uh, clear? Or because the point is, I, I think I, in this course you have been convinced that we can't just. Uh, there are lots of things, lots of questions that people would like to have to answer, like uh, how many cases will we have in a, in in a month or something like that. Which, which cannot be actually answered or have to be answered with a large uncertainty associated which has to communi be communicated together, together with the result. But in practice, what happens? For instance, uh, just to say um, things that happened uh, uh, with my group. So uh, typically in, in, uh, in 2020, I would receive a, a, a call from, from, from journalists uh, asking, uh, when is the next peak? And then you say, okay, there are no data and there are no elements that allow us to make this kind of prediction. So I won't, then, then there's also that you, are, you, you get used to kind of media training, like, right, because the people will insist and then uh, uh, you, you have to be very clear at what you want, say a date, because if, even if you say maybe in two months, is, Next day, you get in the journal in two months. Okay? You have to be really, I mean, you say, I won't say a date. Okay? And the point is, then, this journalist probably called other people. And then there are people that are newcomers that are just starting to work with epidemics. Okay? And they made a simple calculation and, 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 uh, and have a prediction that the peak will be in one month. So the journalists sometimes cannot distinguish between the group that has some, some uh, uh, experience and uh, has, has worked on epidemic modeling and so on, and just newcomers that don't even know the amount of things they ignore. And what happens is that th this person will answer, and the newspaper will or the TV will show the guy and so on. Roberto doesn't know, but this guy knows. <laughs> and then you have a real problem for science communication because there's always somebody willing to answer because people like to be in the, in the, in the spotlight, willing to, to answer questions. And they, they do not have the expertise to answer, but this is not clear most of the time for people from the media, and even for decision makers, which is incredible. But if you want, uh, uh, even the secretary for health at the city or the state of Sao Paulo doesn't know exactly whom he should actually hear. So this poses a, a, a very difficult point about the responsibility of, of, of communicating science in the sense that uh, 
you, you should really only talk about what you know. And second, it would be very important that communication becomes more institutional in this case. For instance, uh, I was talking to, to Anna, and like, like in Germany. In Germany, there's this big institute of public health, that's the Robert Koch Institute. And uh, every week, the Minister for Health would sit together at a press conference with the head of the Robert Koch Institute. And this means uh, the Robert Koch Institute is, is regarded as, as a reference. The Minister for Health cannot just say, I don't care about the Robert Koch Institute, okay? So this is not an option for them. It's not a political option. But it means also that the person that is speaking has the legitimacy to speak in name of a certain scientific consensus of the day. So what happened actually, um, I, I can speak more about Brazil, but I think that happened also in, in other countries, was a lot of people communicated science uh, without knowing exactly what they were saying. And this is very important for scientists to, to, to know. And then, obviously, also another question related to science communication is, is when, how to interface scientific uh, results with decision makers. And this is also much more complicated than we can think in the first uh, moment. For instance, what happened here in Sao Paulo, in the state of Sao Paulo? Who are the persons that talked to decision makers, the Secretary of Health or the Governor. These were not scientists. The, the people that talked to them are actually people from companies which do consultancy, Consul big international consultancy companies. It's called Deloitte, the Boston Consulting Group, uh, how is it called the other one? Well, okay, many of them. And these these people say they, they don't know anything about the epidemic. They are crisis managers, and they hear to scientists, and then they produce a dashboard. And then with this dashboard, they talk to decision makers, but scientists never talk to them. And then you have a real problem of this, uh, in this chain of decisions. It becomes really problematic because the intermediate guys, this, these people that do the consultancy, they actually are not really prepared. Uh, at least the ones that we got in touch are people that could not distinguish between uh, uh, very uh, with people that are doing modeling in, in, in a completely newcomers and uh, they are, I don't know, they, they don't work with the subject and people that actually work with the subject. That's what's not clear for these people. So this is also a thing that has to be discussed is the state, in this case, the Ministry of Health or the Secretary of Health of the state, they need to have a body of, of employees of high scientific, well-trained scientific people in order to be able to talk to people that are researchers. And uh, this is not happening and that should be very important, actually. So I think that's, uh, that, uh, that's, that's enough for me. <laughs> Unless you want to make a Okay, so now I have to follow that. Um, so as you guys know, this is the final uh, lecture of your wonderful course. I hope you're having a, a good time, but most importantly, I hope that you leave here energized to learn more, which is basically what we really want to. So um, the course organizers uh, asked me if the final lecture could be uh, a little bit more forward-looking about you know, um, what it is to really be prepared for a pandemic. Um, and I, I really don't know how to answer that, so I try to answer it the best way that I can by doing a little bit of a retrospective of the kinds of works my group did from the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, but the take-home is a bit of a follow-up from Roberto's lecture, which is focusing on the question. So what is the question that you're on to answer? Uh, what are the data that you have available? 
Uh, and then only then you start thinking about what kinds of models would potentially be appropriate to attempt at answering the question. So a lot of the work actually spends on question formulation, and we'll, we'll go a little bit about, about that. So it's going to be a mix of technical and philosophical uh, modeling today. So I hope it's still interesting as a, as a wrap up. So let's see. For some, okay. ah, perfect. So this is a very grim reality, but uh, there's about on average 200 epidemics a year. Uh, obviously not all of them uh, turn into pandemics, but the reality is that um, more and more every year, there's a potential for a new pandemic to occur because of several things, like we are more connected uh, globally. Um, there's, of course, climate change, land use change. Um, the population is growing at a rate that has never seen before. Um, also, you know, of course, we know that in different countries, there's a tension between uh, science and, and politics. So those are things that, of course, uh, make it so that we should actually expect uh, more and more opportunities uh, for uh, epidemics with potential for pandemics. So, for instance, in, in, in Brazil, uh, you guys have been suffering uh, and burdened with dengue, Zika, and chikungunya for decades, but we know that the three of them actually have a high potential for, for pandemic as climate is changing and the vector is expanding, for instance. So there's all of these factors that even diseases that are not emerging nov novelly, uh, they actually have a potential to become a global problem very quickly. So here is just a, a little review of, of some of the pandemics throughout the years. So uh, we have the, the swine influenza in, in 2009 um, that uh, actually originated in Mexico. Uh, and at the time, it was actually very surprising that it actually started in Mexico because most of the world was looking f uh, at Asian countries as a potential for zoonosis given the previous experiences, and of course in Africa. So it's really kind of a reminder. This photo is, is more so for you guys to, to go back when the, sli when the slides are uploaded and you go home, to really think about the global distribution of the potential of zoonotic diseases and how it's actually spread throughout uh, and the, the different factors that might actually lead to these episodes becoming uh, a problem. So that's something I just really wanted you guys to, to have in your mind that um, preparedness doesn't really start only when the first case starts in humans, but rather thinking about what are the conditions that lead for something to actually become a problem. So that leads me to a, bit, a big chunk of, of the lecture today, which is about data the timing and curation of these data. So uh, thinking about how some data are important throughout, uh, but some other data are actually only important at different timings uh, of, of, a, of an epidemic. So uh, thinking about, uh, so this is a way of course of linearizing the problem because when in fact this is of course not a, a linear timeline, but thinking about uh, what time zero really is. If you're thinking about, if you're an ecologist or a, f uh, a field biologist, your time zero of surveillance is actually environmental uh, circulation of pathogens or in wildlife, uh, and really that, that is your time zero. But if you're thinking about uh, people in this room, mostly, um, we're really thinking about that our time zero probably is when we start first start uh, surveilling cases in the human population, right? So that in itself becomes already a first obstacle, is defining of what time zero is uh, and how potentially we might be um, best thinking about how to integrate surveillance in wildlife and environment and when things uh, actually start in a 
in an epidemic uh, in a human population in this case. So then what that means is that at different times uh, in this in this case, linear timeline, of course, we actually know that this is a, a much more complex situation. What kinds of data can we actually collect uh, and what kinds of methods can be done to, can be developed to actually uh, eventually integrate or triangulate these data uh, to really, uh, at each step, information informing the follow, following step. And of course we know that once it reaches humans, it can actually go back uh, into uh, wildlife and just keep having this spillover, spillback effect because populations are actually all connected. So there are some data streams that of course are considered perhaps the main actors if this was a movie. Right? So if this was uh, you know, a, a movie you watch in Netflix uh, after this course, you can think about uh, genomic surveillance data as your main actor right? or main actress. These data are uh, actually informative throughout. But as you'll see by some of my examples, there are data, uh, particularly when we're thinking about uh, once an epidemic reaches a human population, that are only useful at particular times. Uh, so these are the best friends of our main actors, right? They show up in some scenes, but then they go away and they might come back uh, at the end. So these are things like uh, Google Trends or social media data that are actually really important uh, at the beginning of an epidemic when we don't know a lot about biological traits of the pathogen and we don't have a way of testing individuals uh, to confirm whether uh, they have been infected or not. So there are data streams that are very useful uh, in an opportunistic way, but their usefulness actually is ephemeral and it becomes uh, quite um, noisy after a while. So that's also something to take into account. And in each example, I will tell you how timely the data were uh, and whether they became useful or useless uh, at, a, at a particular time. So that's really the, the main idea here is thinking about what's time zero, how can you incorporate data streams that are perhaps not always obviously related to the problem at hand, uh, and really thinking about how decisions uh, and models that are particularly focusing on a particular part of your system might actually affect for forward transmission and, and leakage into, into other populations. So I think this is a summary perhaps of uh, concepts that Joshua may have talked about this morning, which is transmission of infectious diseases, of course, heterogeneous. We know this because uh, individuals are different, either in their susceptibility, vulnerability, uh, in their connection with other individuals. But most importantly as well, thinking about the population level, we know that some populations, um, because of their demographic or socioeconomic composition, uh, or even their age distribution, uh, end up suffering uh, or not suffering as much, um, depending on, on the kinds of populations they are. Uh, we also know that spatial structure is important, so how connected a particular population is, uh, or how isolated a particular population is. And we've seen that uh, not only with COVID, but of course with many other uh, infectious diseases in the past. Um, I guess there's there's been some, of course, discussion as well on who, g who gets most impacted. And here we can think about your social vulnerability, so your ability for health access, your ability for um, actually staying at home if you're infectious, so socioeconomic vulnerability, but also physical vulnerability, as we saw with, with COVID, that some, some populations with comorbidities were actually far more impacted in terms of disease severity. Um, but the thing that uh, particularly I was mostly interested uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, which was the only thing I could not really understand at all, was uh, how can we actually understand host behavior in real time, right? But most importantly, how can we measure host behavior in real time? 
what are the kinds of data that can actually allow us to quantify uh, an approximation of behavior, uh, or can we only use certain data streams to act as a proxy uh, for these kinds of parameters we might want to use in our model. So why should we integrate uh, surveillance and analytics, right? Why, why should we actually utilize different data streams uh, that are collected at different uh, time frames, at different scales, for different purposes? What, what's the whole point of this? So information, right? Uh, I think information is key, uh, and the more information we have, the faster we can actually develop different types of approaches um, for a better public health response in, in three main areas. Of course, the first one is policy responses, so uh, related to all sorts of uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, the release of vaccines, when, how much, how, uh, which populations should be uh, first targeted, uh, and so on. Then, of course, medical countermeasures, so uh, the release of, of particular medications that might actually be used for something else uh, that can all of a sudden be utilized for a new problem at hand. And we saw that uh, a bit uh, with a lot of failures uh, during COVID in that regard. And then finally, of course, individualized care. So understanding that there are certain types of data streams that can actually allow for almost personalized medicine or uh, something that has failed spectacularly personalized public health, uh, which is still something that we can't really do just yet. Uh, but really is, is really trying to understand how we can integrate uh, different data streams to really track the spread and evolution of novel pathogens, but also existing pathogens to really have a, a nimble and a faster response. So this is kind of like the way my, my lab works um, is really understanding that transmission occurs at different temporal and spatial scales. And depending on the question, we'll be fo we would focus on the pathogen, on the host movement, on immunity, uh, or other factors, depending on the question. But it's really understanding that you need to embrace complexity across scales uh, to really start uh, addressing problems, particularly in an epidemic setting where things are developing fast uh, and uh, where every step actually affects uh, the continuation uh, of an epidemic. So I'm going to divide the work that we did uh, in several stages. So it's going to be detecting, monitoring, uh, understanding, uh, and then designing strategies, and finally prediction. So I'm going to walk you through different projects that pertain to different uh, questions that we ask in this. So because uh, all of this work is going to be focusing on COVID, uh, we start with detecting. So this is early work um, that started uh, on January 2nd, 2020, uh, that was first commissioned by the World Health Organization. I was, I was asked to join a technical advisory group. Um, and the mandate uh, was really to, for us to start having ideas surrounding uh, when should we uh, close borders? Should we close borders? Is it a futile exercise? Is there a right timing for it? Or are we all doomed? So those were the first mandate questions we had uh, for the technical advisory group. So the way that we... In kind of dissected the question was kind of when did SARS-CoV-2 arrive in a given country? That was the first question. And the second question is, can we actually um, quantify uh, and identify who exported what to where, right? So the, the source country, the sink country, and can we actually estimate that over time? So today I'm not going to be focusing a lot on the math uh, for several reasons. First, because 
this is the last lecture and you guys look a little bit tired. Um, but uh, all of these papers are on the folder that's going to be shared with you. And then, of course, after this course, if you need to talk to me for details, we are, I'm absolutely available. So we start with a question, right? When did SARS-CoV-2 arrive in a particular country? And then the second question was, who exported the most and when? Like, did that change over time? So the data that we had at the beginning uh, of, of what was not even called a pandemic uh, were genomic surveillance data uh, that started uh, popping up. And of course, we had uh, case reports that also started trickling at different rates and at different times for, for every country. And then um, we started thinking, what other data streams can we actually utilize opportunistically that can augment our ability to estimate if something is already in a given country uh, and how connected countries are with each other. So, because we had some experience with mobility data, uh, we purchased flight data um, that would give us the number of individuals traveling from uh, a country to another every day. So we had daily uh, number of travelers between every country in the world. So we had at least an, uh, an opportunity to build a matrix of connections between countries, right? So the underlying data stream of this, of this model was really how connected each country was with everywhere else. So with the genomic surveillance data, which is not shown here in the methodology, we used uh, phylogenomic techniques to calculate the molecular clock. And that's a little bit beyond what you guys have been focusing today and this week, but really it allows us to understand how fast uh, something was spreading. It was also allow us to understand if it was evolving fast enough and also allow us to estimate timing of arrival in a given country. We also allowed us at the time to also understand that it really had started in China uh, around September, October uh, of the previous year and how it had started being spread. Uh, so, because this model uh, was commissioned for the World Health Organization, uh, it was a service model, so we were actually not, uh, we were not allowed to publish it until now, actually, these many years later. So, the, the question at hand was how connected populations are to each other. So, because the question was about connection, we knew that the model needed to be spatial uh, explicitly. Right? So we needed to build a metapopulation style model, uh, which is in many words to say that we model at the population level and then we use the flight data to uh, connect the strength uh, between countries. Because we had data on genomic surveillance and we had reporting data um, with a transmission model at the population level, uh, we had uh, uh, SEIR, so L here is for latent, which is the same as um, exposed. So we had uh, susceptible, latent, uh, asymptomatic, symptomatic, and then we had uh, the D compartment. Uh, it's not really a transmission compartment, but it was a reporting compartment because we knew reporting was a huge issue at the time. So we were tracking reported cases to then fit those reported cases to the actual data that was being reported. So this was, uh, to answer a question on my first lecture, a way to validate uh, our model uh, in that sense. And of course, we were tracking recovered as well. So we had a transmission model, like the ones that Joshua uh, and Roberto have been explaining to you guys, that of course has force of infection, has uh, incubation, uh, has um, our recovery rates. And so, like, the, the model itself is fairly simple uh, at the population level. It's really just tracking the flow uh, between individuals. In this format uh, is shown um, 
as a, a, a discrete time model, not because I don't like differential equations, you'll see that I've used differential equations in other forms, uh, but because this model was then um, uh, developed as a stochastic simulation, of course, this is the better way uh, to show how, how the model is constructed. Um, and so the reason why the model was stochastic, uh, particularly for this question as well, uh, was because uh, at the introduction of a novel pathogen, um, the, the system is stochastic, right? There, there's a, a probability of something arriving to a given place. It doesn't follow a deterministic path. And so it's very important to add that probabilistic sense uh, of arrival and spread uh, in a population. So what is in this plot here is uh, we have countries on the uh, y-axis and we have time on the x-axis and we have, um, we have uh, our model starting uh, in uh, the beginning of November of 2019 and it was going all the way to uh, March, no, all the way to uh, May 2020. Why, why is this model only covering this part? Because the question for this model was not really uh, internal spread, but really emergent. So we were only interested as something arriving in the country. It's still a mechanistic model because we were interested in the mechanisms of how thing, our countries or our populations are connected to each other and how a disease spreads. But we were not interested in following a transmission that was internal to a population because one, at the time, we did not have that kind of information. Um, the assumptions were that uh, everyone in the population was susceptible, of course, of varying degrees. And so the question was, in the first six months of, of, a, of an epidemic, where did it arrive and what can we say about time of arrival? So. I'll start with the red dots. So the red dots here uh, are uh, the timing of the first policy implemented in the country. So uh, this is where um, this is where the countries uh, first uh, uh, closed their borders. Right. So this this is the first time they say we're going to close our borders because we want to make sure no cases come from anywhere else. In uh, the blue dot is our central estimation um, of when the actual uh, first case might have arrived. And because this stochastic model, uh, it has uh, a confidence interval here uh, because obviously these are models that deal with uncertainty, right? So uh, we have the arrival time and you'll see that um, given the information that we had for our meta population and how connected countries were, uh, the estimated arrival time uh, was fairly different, uh, but it was on average uh, about two weeks uh, between, you know, start and start in one place and, and another. So in general, by January, uh, between January 1st and February 1st, there were cases everywhere in the world. Uh, we're not showing all of the countries here, but we're basically modeling the whole world. Uh, and we were estimating that it had arrived everywhere, even though it hadn't been um, reported everywhere. Of course, the closer countries were with China, and by closer, I don't necessarily mean geographically closer, but uh, mobility closer, right? The faster uh, cases we arrived in a country. So now this is the part that it's kind of cool uh, in, a, in a perverse way. So I'm telling you that our estimation for the actual arrival date uh, is between more or less January, um, January 1st and February 1st, of course, with some potential use a little bit sooner. But in green are the dates, and normally they are start in March, in greens are the dates uh, of the first reported case in every, in every country. So you see that on average, uh, there was about a month, a month and a half of delay between the estimation of arrival and the actual reporting. 
the size of the bubble is the number of cases that were reported in the first day that they started being reported. So already that is, of course, an indication that, uh, well, several things. It's an indication of how good the country is at reporting, of course, but also it's an indication of perhaps the problem did not start that day, but rather a few weeks prior. And then uh, the, the gray bars uh, is the, uh, the timing of internal, um, internal measures. Right, so how, how soon internal measures started. So normally, uh, in most countries, if not all, um, the border closures was the first measure that was done. Uh, and then only then, a few weeks later, did internal measures of, of stopping of spread start, like, uh, you know, staying at home, uh, allow, telling people to, you know, restrict contacts and so on. So there are very interesting things for this model, of course, uh, talking a little bit about what uh, Roberto said. Uh, while this was very useful for us to indicate uh, to a stakeholder, right, to a decision maker, in fact, in this case, an advisor, uh, because, of course, the World Health Organization doesn't have a decision power, that we were telling that in every country in the world, things were already problematic from the beginning of the, of the, the year 2020, uh, we could see that regardless of that situation, two things were happening. Countries were restricting their borders uh, more or less at the same time, regardless of their awareness uh, of when they thought cases were in their country. So this started to ask, like, making us ask questions about collective behavior, right? So this idea that I will do what my neighbor is doing, not necessarily as a retaliation, but really because if they're doing, maybe it's something I should be doing. So that was actually very useful for a lot of countries, right? That allowed for some countries to um, start acting a lot sooner than they actually thought they were. Uh, but for other countries was, of course, too late. So the next question that we were asked by the, by the, the technical advisory group was, yeah. Oh, sorry. So, the, uh, so for China, there is an error bar for China, but for the purposes of initial conditions of the model, uh, we, we picked uh, November 1st as the, the initial conditions. In the supplementary part of, of the paper, we actually have the error bar and we have different scenarios that start all the way from September 1st. But that's a very good question. So wait, the first question that uh, a colleague here in, pre in Presential asked was why th was there no uh, error bar uh, for China. Uh, and then I said that there is, but for the purposes of this particular simulation that I'm showing, we picked this as the initial conditions. No, so we, we were using, uh, at the beginning we were, because we're not interested, uh, well, we were interested, but because we were mostly focused on between country movement in that small part of like part of the of the year, right? We were focusing on uh, flight transport, like air transportation, because it was the easiest uh, data to to get. So uh, further um, in the slides for the American example, I'll like you, I'll actually show you a model for which we used. Um, trucks uh, routes and ground transportation and flights. So uh, it's a question of, again, as I was saying earlier, so the question was, why was just flight data and not ground data and other types of movement? So the, the, the main thing in an epidemic setting as well is understanding that our data that are very difficult to get immediately. And you have to make compromises and assumptions. Right? So the assumption was uh, at the global scale, 
flight data would be data that would capture movement, global movement, uh, to get at the minutia of uh, municipalities or states that, for instance, are border states between countries. Of course, those data would have been precious and really, really useful, right? Um, but at the time was simply not a possibility because we were, you know, we had deadlines every week. We had to show uh, a different result. Um, but that's actually a very, a very uh, astute question as well. Any more questions? Okay, so I'll, I'll continue. So the next question that we we were using this model for uh, was to because it was related to border closures was where are the cases arriving from, uh, from December all the way to April. So here the colors depict a country. So you see that in December 2019, uh, cases were exported uh, from China to everywhere in the world. Uh, but as uh, time went by, so we went from December to January to February. So by February uh, 4, China closed their borders, right? So by, uh, by February 5th, 6th, there was really no more uh, exporting of cases from China to the rest of the world. And because, of course, the outbreak in Italy had already started and it was actually uh, at the same time as Carnival, uh, which we all know and love. Um, there was a lot of people visiting Italy, North Italy, precisely, and we start seeing that in February, when the when the cases were exploding in Italy, Italy actually became the biggest exporter of cases uh, in our estimates. So you know where. Uh, at the World Health Organization and at the G20, they were, uh, you know, only talking about closing their borders to China. We were already advising them, if you're going to close borders, you have to close borders everywhere, because otherwise it's going to be a leaky border situation. So then, of course, Italy exploded. They closed their borders. Uh, and then by March and April, uh, not surprisingly, uh, the only country that really did not have borders closed but was really not allowing anyone to come in was the U.S. So all of a sudden, the U.S. became the biggest exporter of cases. So by, by April, uh, just before everyone really uh, grounded their flights, so these simulations ended in April because it was the end of the emergence, right? But also it was when the whole world stopped and there were no more uh, connections with the countries. So we were able to, to show uh, the, the, the timing of the passing of the baton of who was exporting more, right? So uh, at every instance, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we could see that there was a different uh, contribution. So uh, then the, the question that we were asked was, so when is it no longer needed for us to worry about uh, our borders, right? When should we only start thinking about, um, you know, internally? So that question, uh, we answered this question with different types of analysis. Uh, and visualizations for decision makers. So in this case, I'm sorry, the, the, the video is really crap. So this is US. Uh, and this is the x-axis is time. Uh, and the y-axis has two axes. One is local cases, and the other one is imported cases. So the colors go, it's the probability, right? So uh, the, the dark color, is a kind of zero or close to zero. So as it goes from gray to, to the light color, you're basically going from zero probability of having local cases uh, to a, a, a high probability, to a one probability of having internal cases. So obviously, as expected, imported cases for the US and for everywhere else starts with a high probability of having mostly imported cases. And then as time goes by, uh, it goes to zero and it becomes dominated uh, by local cases. So these two 
colors here, these two lines here, are um, implementation of closing the borders completely and uh, the start of uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. So what we showed in this plot specifically was by the time the US decided closing their borders, they already had a month and a half of internal transmission. So by the time they, they decided to close their borders, uh, they already had a problem in their hands that was completely irrespective of, of how they would keep people away. And then in this plot here that unfortunately you, we cannot see very well is again time. Uh, and on the top is the major contributions uh, of different countries to the country. Right, so uh, it starts with China, of course, then it's Italy, as we saw before, but then it's really driven by the connections each country has, right? So by April, uh, the contributions of back and forth cases were Mexico, Canada, uh, and the UK were the biggest contributions of back and forth uh, with the US. So, and it's the same for different countries. So I'm going to skip this and I'm going to focus on Brazil that is here at the very bottom. Uh, because the idea is really exactly the same, right? By the time uh, every country enacted border closures, which is the green, the green line, this is Italy, uh, they basically already had local cases, uh, but you know, Italy was one of the first ones, so they actually were a little faster and more proficient uh, in, in keeping cases from outside out. But this is the case of Brazil. Brazil did really well in certain parts of COVID uh, control, but when it came to external policies, it was quite disastrous, right? So they only closed their borders. They were one the very last ones to close their borders, which meant that by the time they closed their borders and they actually started enacting local policies, as you can see, this is the local one, it was already completely uh, local transmission. So this kind of uh, allowed us to show uh, within our uh, modeling group to the World Health Organization that the timing of a policy actually is really important, right? Uh, so that, that is the first message that I wanted to start with in, in this lecture, right? When you're thinking about detection, is uh, kind of thinking about what kinds of data can you utilize to create a model that tells you something about arrival. So now we're gonna, to, gonna jump from detecting to monitoring. So now something is in your country or in your state or in your city, how do you actually keep tabs tabs on it, right? So um, there were th several things we did uh, in my group. The first thing was, uh, especially, I mean, in every country, but in the US situation, um, reporting of cases uh, was very heterogeneous. Uh, testing was not really something that was happening everywhere, and it was incredibly heterogeneous between states. Uh, and so we kind of took a page from earlier studies for influenza and started thinking about, can we infer uh, behavior, uh, seeking information behavior through Google uh, Trends? Like, can we look at Google data and, and find out something about potential cases, potential uh, individuals uh, looking for their symptoms, but most importantly, can we see protective evidence of protective behavior after the first case is announced in their own state? So this was not a mechanistic model uh, because the question was, can we identify uh, evidence of changes in behavior? So of course, the methodology that was most appropriate for this case was a statistical model. Uh, that was looking at uh, changes in time. So we were identifying time zero, and in time zero for us uh, was the first case reported uh, in, in, the, in that state uh, or in a neighboring state. To, in this case, I'm only showing you the results for a model at the state level um, for, for notifications in their own state. And then 
using a Poisson model, uh, uh, which I already put the paper uh, in the folder, so you can really go into the details of the model. Um, we were evaluating if there were significant changes uh, in the Google Trends um, dynamics in regards to, in this case, uh, searches for the word co uh, coronavirus. So we were looking to see if people were uh, dramatically changing uh, their search for coronaviruses. So from the big, so this is uh, first case in general in the U.S. Of course, this is a, a model that is for all states. Um, so where I is for state. Um, the idea is that we were able to show that in the next five days there was a significant peak of searches of people like what is coronavirus. They wanted to understand what it was. Uh, but that behavior was searching behavior, right? Can I know what COVID is? And then after a few, a few weeks, then uh, the behavior kind of goes back to baseline. And the first thing that was important for us to realize from this is that some data are ephemeral, right? They're not useful for the whole time. So after about a month and a half uh, of the first case being announced, information was um, more uh, disseminated in a better way, right? There were uh, dashboards for, for every state, uh, there were news on the, on the TV, there were newspaper articles. So people started getting their information from all sorts of, of ways. And so Google Trend data, after a month and a half uh, of actually having your first case um, in, your, in your population, were actually no longer useful. But they were very useful in understanding very dramatic peak behavior that could tell us something about. Uh, COVID or COVID symptoms. So, of course, we didn't search just for the word coronaviruses. We had a whole dictionary uh, of, of different things that ranged from symptoms all the way to uh, in kind of protective measures such as quarantine, uh, sanitizer, testing, uh, and of course, we went all the way to uh, conspiracy theories, right? Yeah. Yes, so, yes, of course, so the y-axis, uh, so we have, it's an event, it's an event study, so event study defines a day of something, uh, and then it's the change, uh, the change from this point to the back, and the change to that. Oh, it's log scale. Yes, yeah, sorry, I should, yeah. Yes, Magn very dramatic changes. Yes. Ah, oh, yes. I have a good point. I I forgot to say that. Uh, these are very dramatic results. Yes. 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 Yeah. It's log. No, it's log, not log ten. Yeah. It's still very large. That's right. It's still very large. So even in this situation where it just appears like it's a teensy blip, it's actually quite large. Uh, the only one that actually had basically no change uh, was actually coronavirus conspiracy. So people from the very beginning uh, were really kind of searching that, you know, for words like hoax, conspiracy, um, and all sorts of kind of uh, bad fake news type of situation. Only in the US. This is for the US only. Yes. Um, this was the first paper we published uh, in March 2020. So um, this is not analysis per se, but is data collection. So when, because at the time I was based uh, in the state of Indiana, 
uh, this is kind of to follow up on something Roberto was saying about, you know, the difference between reporting for papers versus uh, service to your community, right? So uh, my team developed a dashboard for the state of Indiana that um, is, is, a, is a state in the middle of the country, right? And it's uh, not a very wealthy state. And most importantly, uh, has a very different communities uh, between, you know, the, the, the city, so the capital of the state, Indianapolis, and then as you go to rural areas. So the urban areas uh, are areas that have a lot of immigrants uh, and um, different uh, population groups, whereas in the rural areas is mostly uh, elderly uh, Americans, white Americans, and so the populations were actually very different. So we were asked to develop a dashboard that was at the uh, county state, which is an equivalent to a municipality uh, in Brazil, and we were tracking number of cases, number of deaths, hospitalizations, uh, and we used a, a model to then, of course, estimate recovery and, and susceptible and infections uh, throughout the period, and this is actually still ongoing um, in 2023, but of course, information is, is a lot slower now. So we were capturing all sorts of different data streams, and then by ethnicity, uh, looking at the different uh, groups from white Americans, black Americans, other nationalities, Asian, uh, and, uh, of course, indigenous populations as well. So we were really tracking every aspect of the population uh, for all sorts of uh, parameters we were interested in. So cases, hospitalizations, deaths, to really start understanding whether there was um, a lot of disparity uh, within the state. And, of course, we were able to show that uh, to the government to the governor of Indiana, and a lot of local policies were enacted uh, for that. So that's the only thing I want to say about that. So the next subject matter uh, for this is understanding. What? What? Well, how much more time do I have? What time is it? Oh, it's five o'clock. Oh, fuck. Um, <laughs> oh, beep. Uh, oh, I blame Roberto. Um, all right, so I'm going to go faster, but I'll tell you. Uh, so I'll tell you about the questions and the models, and then I'm going to expect that you guys go over the papers. And you have my email, and I will be available for any question, including the people online. You are more than welcome to contact me. So I'm going to go fast now. So the, the, uh, the question for understanding was based in the US. We had a question from the Office of Science and Technology uh, that was uh, a, gov a governmental, it's a governmental office that wanted to, uh, that asked us, can we say something about ur urban versus rural? Because on the news, there was this weird perception that urban centers uh, were hit first and then urban uh, rural areas were uh, much slower. So we wanted, the question was, why did some counties take longer to, get COVID, which was their question, <laughs> and then uh, does the network structure determine synchrony of epidemics? And what does that mean? Does it arrive everywhere at the same time, or is there a difference between areas? So for that, um, we had a bunch of different data sets, because of course this uh, was actually a, a year into the pandemic. So we had the case reports, digital uh, electronic records, um, we had purchasing data, so we had access to pharmaceutical data, so over-the-counter drugs, uh, COVID-related drugs, prescription, and so on. Uh, and, of course, we had mobility data, and this is where we had uh, land mobility, uh, like cell phone data, and, of course, uh, travel data. And uh, we were interested in understanding the vulnerability of the population. So we had indexes like how vulnerable a population is, which is an index from zero to five, uh, five being very vulnerable, 
zero being super wealthy. Uh, and uh, finally, the rurality index, which is how rural a, a, an area is. And this, this map is to show really that the dark ones were early reporting and the yellow were late reporting. So you actually see a lot of heterogeneity in the US. So for this, because the question was, why did some get uh, COVID much later, we used the network model and we, we were interested in redefining uh, redefining communities and move away from border, uh, state borders for definition of policy. So this paper is was just accepted, but again, it was a delay because it was a commissioned uh, work for the government. Uh, so I'm going to skip that and uh, just going to leave you with pretty pictures here. So because this is uh, a network model uh, and we were interested in partitioning uh, the different components as to why something was arriving, uh, perhaps earlier in some areas and later in some areas, we were using um, a community, community uh, and network measures, and we were looking at uh, urban versus rural, and then hazard, which was when something was arriving in a particular area, and then this vulnerability index, and then finally we were redefining uh, communities. So with this kind of approach, we were able to uh, really get at the drivers as to why something was arriving earlier in one area. And most importantly, we had a recommendation that of course didn't go anywhere, but hopefully will go some at some point, which is policies should not be designed and implemented at the state level, but rather at the community level, because we would see that uh, counties uh, in border areas were actually behaving often like the state next to it, rather than their own state. So the policies that were advised um, or um, mandated in their own state were actually completely inappropriate. Uh, for for that state. So I'm going to skip the designing control, but this question is uh, was again commissioned work for the Italian government. Uh, and it was really, it was a mechanistic model, an agent-based model, and that's why I keep it here. Uh, so you guys can actually see a formulation of an agent-based model. And this agent-based model was important because we were looking at the best testing policies for the whole of Italy uh, to see how often should you test in a school to, to keep the schools uh, open. So the, pap the paper is already in the folder. I hate Roberto. He stole my time. <laughs> Uh, so the final one is, I guess, because I thought uh, that um, Renato was going to talk about variants. So this is a project that we have uh, about variants' fitness advantage. So we're tracking different variants for COVID. Uh, and it's, uh, again, not a mechanistic model because we're interested uh, in kind of the time of arrival. Uh, of a particular variant uh, in a given country. So it's a Bayesian hierarchical model um, that uh, allows us to estimate the, the arrival and presence of a given variant in a country, uh, even for countries uh, that for which there's no genomic surveillance data. So this is a genomic surveillance model. And this paper is also in the folder for you guys. But what I want to show you this is for you, Flavio, pay attention. We did validation. Uh, so I want you to focus on that when you go and read it. So we validated our model uh, by kind of hind casting to see how, how, how good we were at understanding arrival. I'm showing Portugal because I'm Portuguese and it's one of the best countries in the world. So uh, finally, I'm gonna end with real-time tracking. So a lot of these models are useful as well for real-time tracking. So we actually have a dashboard that is not public, but uh, a lot of countries with which we partner use it to really, um, so it's a nowcast model. So we use uh, days, we use information for the past 90 days uh, and then we now cast for two weeks. Uh, so this is from yesterday. Uh, and um, basically we're able to say with some certainty, of course, what variants are starting to appear or the ones that are kind of already going away. 
Again, this is not a mechanistic model for the purpose uh, of the fact that we're only interested in what's arriving and what's kind of there. So the next step is to create a mechanistic model to understand why some variants are more uh, effective in a particular country uh, and not others. So, uh, yes, each line is a variant. The paper is also in the, in the folder. So I've never had to speak this fast in my entire life. And so uh, I leave you with these words of wisdom, which is never just bring data to a story fight. You always have to ask the question, uh, and you always have to shape your message. Thank you. And do you want to give the final words? That's right. Uh, so we are truly at time, and I know people probably would like to ask Anna questions, but since we uh, advertised this, to, to go to five. Maybe if Anna could stick around for a few minutes, uh, then people could follow up with some questions. But if people need to leave, I get it. And just one last comment. You just got a note from Elisa Pomari with the survey link. Uh, my general sense of these surveys, if you don't do it like today, not to say